this is the way the Quran is looking at it, is that there is a conflict going on. And this is why the historical stories in the Quran relate to prophets coming up against oppressors, coming up against tyrants. Pharaoh and Musa is the most repeated story in the Quran. Very important story. The, you, Lewis Mumford in, wrote a two volume work called The Myth of the Mega Machine. And in that book, his thesis is that basically what he calls them the axial prophets, these prophets that come around, uh, I think about a thousand BC until uh, Muhammad, which he considers the last of these axial prophets. And he said what these prophets do is that they're really shutting down the mega machine. Right? In other words, the idea of this massive social project that relates to the world. The Pharaoh has his pyramids and he's going to build them and there's a lot of people that are going to die in the process. But they're going to carry those rocks and they're going to carry it and do it all all for the glory of the Pharaoh or the society or whatever. Now one of the things that Mumford says is that there is a movement, this historical movement towards the mega machine that in prior times its nuts and bolts were human beings, right? The whole social project. And he thinks that Pharaoh and Musa is the best archetype of this phenomenon. That the Musa, Moses comes in and is directly a challenge to the Pharaonic project. That the, that the prophets literally challenge this idea that we are here for the glorification of a hierarchy and at the top is this elite. And so the Quran uses this idea, they're called the mala, the, the people up, the high people, the elite, the elect of the world. And the Quran is really constantly bringing this up and even goes into their inner di discourse which is fascinating literally you can hear what they talk about when they're you know because one of the things is he's telling his mela he said listen we got to get rid of this guy Moses because he's gonna corrupt our people right so he sees you know this is a corrupting element because he's gonna teach him not to worship us right not to say the Pharaoh's God not to give me the authority that I'm entitled to that is a disrupting element to the power elite when you have a teaching that is literally challenging the very foundations of that, of that structure. And this is something very powerful in the Quran and there are many examples of it. In the political terminology of Islam, this is called shirk. When Fir'aun declared, and of course everyone knows what Fir'aun said, Ana rabbukumul a'la I am the one who is sovereign. I possess sovereignty. That was shirk. When they declared, in Articles 24 and 25 of the Charter of the United Nations, which the Republic of Iran, oh sorry, sorry, the Islamic Republic of Iran has not as yet read, what they declare? That the Security Council of the United Nations is vested with supreme authority in the world. In all matters pertaining to international peace and security, that was shirk. When they declared that sovereignty belonged to them, not to Allah, that was shirk. It was shirk for Fir'aun, it is shirk for them. Investigative reporter for the New American Magazine and author of the United Nations Exposed, William F. Jasper. Certainly one of the most important principles uh, embodied in the U.S. Constitution is the recognition that individual rights come from God and the purpose of government is to protect those rights. The United Nations uh, recognizes no God above the UN. Uh, the United Nations therefore recognizes no uh, impediments or restrictions on its power. The next thing is the military. 
which is Junuduhuma, the armies of Fir'aun and Haman. The, the, they have to have an army. This, the United Nations in the attempt to create a world army that will literally police people in the same way like uh, Noam Chomsky has mentioned it becomes like a mafia protection agency. If you're not paying up, then they send the mafia in to break some arms, break some legs. This is what they do so that they have a, create a world army that will begin to do these things. The author, MIT professor Lincoln P. Bloomfield, also explains that the UN would have to have an unchallengeable monopoly on military power. A world effectively controlled by the United Nations is one in which world government would come about with the establishment of supranational institutions. We do have a guest here today, I'm Grandmaster Mike Sutton from the Masons. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Hodgson and I am the Grandmaster of Masons in Massachusetts. The first aspect is Fir'aun. Fir'aun is the political system. The political system is the Freemasonic constitutional system of separation of religion, of any form of religion, in the acts and decisions of the state system. In other words, morality is literally thrown out and Machiavellian principles are implemented. The principles based on efficiency and the benefit of the ruling elite. No other considerations are taken. If it means killing a lot of people, it means killing a lot of people. So this is the secularization of the world. This is what's happened. Islam, as an ideology, remained existing universally after the destruction of its state, the Uthmani Khilafah, in 1924. Because the Islamic Ummah, with all her different peoples, continued to embrace this ideology, despite the fact that it was removed from their practical lives and the international sphere. The ideology remains present in the world, as long as there is an Ummah who embraces it, even though this Ummah does not implement its systems for reasons beyond its will. However, it ceases to exist internationally if there is no state to convey it and direct international policies upon its basis. There is a resurgence. That's very clear. People have attempted to return to their roots, as it were, uh, to, to, to give life to their earlier cultures. We don't want to be like Europe. We don't want to be like, and we want to return to our roots. Now we want to bring back Islam. 